Just ahead on American Black Journal, the new superintendent of Detroit Public Schools is my guest. I'll talk with Dr. Nikolai Vitti about his priorities for the district. Plus, the Detroit Historical Museum commemorates the 50th anniversary of the Detroit Rebellion with a special exhibit. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. We're coming to you today from the Detroit Historical Museum, where a really anticipated exhibition of the 1967 Detroit Uprising has just opened. We'll get the details on that exhibit a little later in the program, but we start with a look at education in Detroit. It's been a month since Dr. Nick Viti officially began his new role as superintendent for Detroit Public Schools Community District. I'm pleased to have Dr. Viti as my guest today. Welcome to Thank American you. Black Journal. Thank you for having me. And welcome home to Detroit. Thank you, it's great to be home. Yeah, so uh, a month. Tell me what you've seen in a month uh, and tell me what it tells you about the, the challenges you face. Is it what you expected? Is it worse than you expected? <laughs> or is it maybe a little better than what you expected? I would say a combination of yeah, everything. All of those things? All of those yeah. things. Um, I, I think what um, has excited me the most is the potential uh, that the school system has, mm -hmm. um, especially in alignment with the resurgence of the city itself economically. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, you know, in talking to principals, talking to teachers, and more importantly, talking to students, uh, you see that we're on the verge of um, aligning the work that has to happen in the school district with the economic development. Yeah. And there's a sense of energy um, and willingness to do things differently. I, in other districts, schools that I've walked into as an agent of change, uh, there's sometimes a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's gonna happen. So I, I don't wanna give the <laughs> you'll, impression you'll get that, to that, right? that, yeah, <laughs> that, that no one's gonna uh, push back on change. Yeah. But what I can tell you is that there's a recognition that we need to th do things differently uh, to do right by children. Yeah. Uh, a week ago, you tweeted uh, about the idea of uh, uh, an event to commemorate like a special teacher of the year here in the right. district. I retweeted you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that brings up the whole idea of teachers and how we think of them, how we treat them here in the city. Also brings up the idea that we don't have enough teachers uh, in Detroit public schools. Talk a little about those issues. Well, there, there's no employee in our school district that's more important than teachers, period. They, they're working with children every day. They determine whether a child reaches their academic or civic potential. And one thing that uh, we, we, I've been looking at when you ask what do we need to do differently is changing the culture of central office to directly support schools, namely classroom teachers and principals. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> we're at a point where we need to change the entire culture with how we recognize teachers, uh, with the great work that they do on an everyday basis, how we highlight um, individual teachers for going above and beyond as far as how they're moving student performance. Um, that comes from just simple recognition, but it also comes with pay. Um, so we, at this point, have a tentative agreement on, on an initial contract. That's just recognizing that pay is important and that it, there, there needs to be at least a bump at this point, but it doesn't uh, define where we need to end as far as teacher salary. So yeah. we're gonna see initial bump, but I commit long-term, especially with an increase in enrollment, uh, to move teacher pay above the suburban pay. And a lot of people are saying, are you crazy? Why, how can you say that in the fiscal uh, situation that Detroit's in right, right now? 
we're a stable district as, as far as finances is concerned, but I think once we see an increase in enrollment, once I have time to dissect uh, the budget, uh, it's about priorities, and our priority has to be to increase teacher pay, but it also has to create a different learning environment and work environment for our, student, our teachers. So um, class size has to be addressed, better curriculum has to be addressed, dealing with discipline issues has to be addressed with, with a, a differentiated approach to discipline and, and alternative schools. Yeah. Um, so all of those, and a central office uh, that is dedicated directly and indirectly to serving schools, teachers, and principals. I'm gonna go through a reorganization in about a week, and we're going to be uh, a bit thinner on the administrative side, <laughs> yeah. which will generate revenue, but the message will be clear that everyone directly or indirectly has to support Should schools. be supporting That's the, right. the, the, the right. kids. Uh, talk about the teacher shortage. Uh, can you get people to fill those spots? And if you do, does it throw the budget out of, out of whack? The budget is balanced this year, largely because we're not paying right. those teachers. What's the interplay there? Well, there's, there's a couple things going on. One. Uh, is pay mm -hmm. and work conditions. Mm -hmm. And so that, that speaks to some of the points I made earlier. Um, but one of the, our main uh, priorities going into this fall is to be fully staffed. And we have to have that mentality. We have to have that sense of urgency. I think there's a story to be told and to be pitched to potential teachers about coming to Detroit. I think every teacher enters a profession uh, to try to maximize students' potential. Mm -hmm. And when you look at potential and untapped potential, I don't think you can go anywhere better than Detroit to do that work. Yeah. We just have to create the right financial package and then create a working environment that's ideal for those teachers. So I think the structure, the story, um, the pitch, if you will, is there. We just have to change the culture and, and, and status of the work environment. And you can that do that and, and stay within the budgetary constraints? Yeah, yeah, because I think it's, it's about priorities. Yeah. And so one thing that we're going to do is create a strategic plan um, that'll be a, a community engagement process, one where the board will be heavily involved. We defined our strategic plan. Obviously, a focus on developing teachers and recruiting teachers will be central to that. And then your budget is driven by that strategic plan and align. And, and so um, salaries, positions have to be at the forefront. And, and then there's things that we can do structurally to generate revenue for salaries and for po teacher positions to, to balance the budget. Uh, for example, we've got have a lot of teachers out of the classroom mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the district level and the school level that'll help the vacancy issue and the budget. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's been true for a long time here in Detroit is that we have great sort of single examples of the way the right. district ought to look, right? Yeah. Uh, Cass Tech, Renaissance, uh, Chrysler Elementary, which now is going to become a Montessori. It feels like we have never taken advantage of those models to try to scale up, to try to say, well, we're doing this here. Why can't we do the same thing somewhere else or a similar thing somewhere else that lifts the, the overall performance of the district? Well, I think part of I agree with you. It's about replicating those best practices in those schools. But what is sometimes unique in those schools is expectations. And, and that's one thing that I think is probably our greatest challenge right now as a school district is we have to increase the level We've of expectation. Think better of what we want. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so we have to stop having this conversation that it's all right for these students. Mm -hmm. it, it's, we, it, it's all of our students. And every student has to be worked with with a sense of urgency. And the question that I'm going to always ask is, is it good enough for your child? So whether you're a district administrator, you're a principal, you're a teacher, mm -hmm. you're a custodian, you're an office worker, it, if, it, if, if, if you are doing something and that in some ways not the right thing for your child, your own child, your flesh and blood, then it's not good for someone else's child. Yeah. And that's about expectation. So if we're gonna have high expectations at CAS, we have to have high expectations uh, at Western. Wherever we are, we treat children like they're our own. Yeah. Uh, we have been arguing about how much money Detroit public schools need, how much money Detroit public schools have in this community for decades, really, since I was uh, a child here in the 70s. Uh, do we have enough now? Uh, are, are we prioritizing schools the way we should, or should we be still looking for a better way to get more cash into the into those coffers. Yeah, I, th I think that the answer to that question is twofold. On the one hand, I do think we can be more efficient and strategic with the dollars that we have. Um, so that's why, as I've started to meet with the business community, I've said I'm not going to make an ask yet 
because I want to show you that we're being as strategic and efficient with our resources. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to aligning the budget with the strategic plan and our priorities. Once we do that, we know that there are going to be gaps mm -hmm. because our children bring an enormous um, need to the schools. Yeah. And so I would say we need a private um, gap filling solution. And the state also has to recognize that you, when you educate a child in Detroit, that per pupil expenditure is naturally going to be higher than be. Northville or right. Garden City or you know any other district. And that's district. an argument we're still trying to you're right. have. I mean, yeah, I, I'm right. not sure everybody in Lansing yeah. agrees with yeah. you. Well, I mean, then they should walk into our schools um, and do home visits and actually talk to our kids and, and our parents and see the reality of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll understand that when you are giving the dollar amount the same as Detroit as a suburban district, it may look like it's equal, but it's not fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you have you had a chance to talk to members of our legislature yet about what's going on in Detroit schools? At a broad level, I, yeah. I, I, when I was in Mackinac, At Mackinac yeah, sure. there were broad conversations, but not specific conversations. I, it, to, to your question and to my earlier point, I think that's why we need to move to a weighted formula mm -hmm. that recognizes poverty, that yeah. recognizes uh, ESE status or English language learner status. Yeah. Some of that is in the Michigan um, funding formula, but it's not deep and it's not wide enough. Um, so those are conversations that I'll be having. But I want to go beyond just conversations. I want to actually show data that, that indicates what we're receiving, the gaps that exist. Right. I mean, even when you look at ESC children, we're, we're, we're educating a larger proportion than other districts, yes. but technically get, receiving the same amount of money with a, <laughs> a bit of an increase from IDA at the federal level, but nowhere where it needs to be. Right. Uh, I want to talk somewhat about <clears throat> students with disabilities. You were a yeah. student who faced some challenges uh, as a young person. We've done an awful job in Detroit uh, dealing with those those children and, and their issues for a long time. Tell me what you've seen uh, in the early the early days. Yeah, I, I would go one step farther to say we've done an awful job nationally uh -huh. uh, in this country mm -hmm. with um, d teaching uh, children with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the, the concentration of poverty coupled with uh, ESE status in Detroit, mm -hmm. then those bad systems nation nationally are exacerbated right. because of all the other issues that we're trying to do with effect, it. Sure. Correct. Um, so we have a lot of work to do nationally, but I would say in Detroit as well. Um, I think that starts with just having the right team mm -hmm. at the district level that has the right vision, that can create the systems, the structure of support and accountability, and then training for teachers, extra resources for teachers, and thinking differently about schools. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's okay to have a conversation of how we go deeper with certain disabilities at certain specialized schools. I think the opportunity when we look at branding our district short term, long term, is to create specialized schools, right. not to isolate students with disabilities, but to go deeper. I've done that with dyslexic students, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. have, being a dyslexic mm -hmm. and, and two of my children being dyslexic, but even students with autism and other needs. I think Detroit can do that better and differently than even the suburbs. And that's one way I think we can attract parents um, to our school system. Yeah. Uh, quickly, I want to ask you about charter schools. That's another debate we've had in this yeah. community now for 20 years. Uh, the, the, the public schools don't really have a level playing field to compete with charter schools. They, they play by different rules. Yeah. Uh, you have said that you want to sort of compete with them and beat them, right? Get more kids yeah. uh, into yeah. the public right. schools. But can you do that without some changes to the way that we manage all that? Uh, we had a big argument about it last summer. Uh, we lost the opportunity to put them under a system uh, that would be similar to public schools. Do we need that for you to be successful? I think it, I think it would help. So that, that goes back to the policy sure. infrastructure that has to be uh, structured the right way in order to implement reform and accountability. But it's interesting when you frame it as debate, mm -hmm. I don't think we should be debating this issue any longer. And, you know, Detroit has been an incubator, testing ground, guinea pig yeah. uh, for years. And we know that charter schools the at results scale- Results not panning out the way they said Charter they schools at scale, uh, as a reform strategy has not worked in Detroit. In fact, it's worked nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's not to say that they're individually, there aren't some good charter schools. Mm -hmm. And if parents are going there and they feel like that's the right option for their children, then so be it. But at scale, it's not working and it won't work. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to be able to talk about that with transparency and a bit of um, clarity and uh, strategy. And that's where I think our lobbying efforts has to improve uh, at the district level, city level, to say we need a, a, the right authorization process. Yeah. Children are not um, 
are not guinea pigs. They're not an experiment. Yeah, and, and, and we know it works. And, and again, it's not a matter of, well, we have to do things differently. That's always been the rationale, the justification. We now know it doesn't work. So how do we create the right guardrails and accountability structure so that we don't have a random process of creating schools? You know, creating a school is not the same as saying that I'm going to be a venture um, entrepreneur right. and create a gas station down right. the street. Right. This is where children go every day in order to receive the skills and knowledge to do better than the, their parents. Yeah. Um, and, and in our, our poorest neighborhoods, we can't experiment. We need best practice. We need the best teachers, best leaders to do right by children, and that's not happening right now. Okay. Dr. Link Laviti, welcome back to Detroit well, thank again. Thank you. It's good to be we'll back. see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Coming up next, a look back at the disturbance of 1967 through the stories of those who lived through it. But first, here's a 1980 Detroit Black Journal interview about the historical significance of African American art. Many of the paintings that um, we have selected, even for the show today, uh, exemplify the movements of the black man in this country. Uh, early on in this century, uh, blacks couldn't necessarily document their history themselves. There were not that many writers. Uh, they, couldn't, they weren't published the way they should have been, and they weren't even allowed to interpret their history. But many artists were painting. Uh, these paintings we hold as a legacy of our past. Uh, they're not necessarily to be interpreted. They, the paint has dried there. So uh, it's not about an artist uh, or a writer saying this is what happened. If it didn't, the painting actually has it there. So I think it's a record of the movements of black people in this country. Uh, it's a statement on what really happened. Now, in terms of black art, have black artists been sort of categorized in various categories as to a mode, a uh, different mode uh, or meaning or significant aspect of the art, say like a moderate artist or a radical artist? Is that that type of dichotomy? Yes, there are several schools of Afro-American art. We have the Afro-Cobra School. Uh, this school, they're basically militant. Uh, they're fighting for black rights. They tend to think that the arts should be used as a vehicle to fight for one's purposes. However, you find this in many societies. Uh, even in the Mexican society, Rivera and uh, different artists like that, they, f they use their art to fight for the country's freedom. However, you still have the aesthetic uh, group of Afro-American Afro artists that simply paint flowers, abstractions, and some just simply paint aesthetic themes that have nothing to do with social uh, practices or politics. So there, there's a dichotomy between the two styles. All right, as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the 1967 civil unrest in Detroit, a long-awaited exhibit on the uprising has finally opened here at the Detroit Historical Museum. It's called Detroit 67 Perspectives. The project looks back at what led up to the events of July 1967, where the city stands today, and how we can best move forward in the city of Detroit. The exhibit will open for one year and it will be accompanied by curator chats, programs, and community discussions. Here to tell us more is the Detroit 1967 Project Director Marlo Stoudemeyer from the Detroit Historical Society, along with Tracy Irwin, who is the curator of the exhibit. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having yeah. us. Yeah. So Marlo, I think of these things uh, as trying to tell a story. It's a narrative. Uh, talk about the story you're trying to tell through this exhibit. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, when we first started the project, you know, people were saying, you know, that week changed everything mm -hmm. and, and drilling it down to just that one moment. And really this is a 100 year look back, right? Going far back as far as 50 years before 1967 to talk about where Detroit has been, how we got to that place, the conditions, the people, the places, the experiences that led up to that point. Uh, I always say people didn't wake up one day angry and just start burning buildings. There was something that got us there, but yeah. then giving context to what happened that week. So you can really bring that story back to life and really have an understanding of the different perspectives, what was happening during that time, whether it be from city, suburb, black, white, it doesn't matter. We wanted to give everyone a voice, but more importantly, it wasn't the end of the story. Mm -hmm. 50 years later in the year 2017, we're still, we're still in it and we're still thinking about it. And if you look at where America is, it's relevant, but more importantly, the opportunity is today looking ahead 50 years to the year 2067 on what we can do now right. to have an impact on what happens 50 years from now. So that's a pretty simple charge, right? Uh, yeah. Just put together Nothing an exhibit that tells this, uh, <laughs> this, this story. Talk about where you start. Uh, even I've been upstairs to see uh, right. the exhibit. It's, it's overwhelming in terms of how much is in there. How lots do you even content. begin to, to, to conceive of something like this? Well, you know, it, it, lots of discussions. <laughs> we brought in a lot of advisors. We, you know, we brought in representatives from the Arab American National Museum, the Charles H. Wright, you know, the, um, 
Michigan Roundtable for Diversity and Inclusion, you know, New Detroit. I mean, so many people had a voice in the early planning of this exhibition. And and there's the book that yeah. accompanies it. And yeah. that was being brought along and it's, you know, it's on sale now uh -huh. in a museum <laughs> store. Um, and, you know, it's Detroit 1967, Origins, Impacts and Legacies. And Joel Stone, um, one of our curators here, uh, really shepherded that project along. And that, that helped serve as a template for yeah. the exhibition. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's it. We really, um, after bringing all of those people together, we wanted to make this about perspective. Yeah. And the oral history archive that was started a little over two years ago. Really impressive. Huge. A body of work there, right? Yes, I and mean, we've got you know over 400. You know, we've got transcripts. We have video oral histories. We have audio oral histories. Those are all in the exhibition. Um, but hearing those stories really helped to sort of lay the groundwork for the mm -hmm. exhibition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, not only individual perspectives, but media perspective. You know, so as you go through the exhibit, you really start to understand how language yes. served, you know, to right. really sort of showcase what your perspective was. Right. Well, and, and indeed the, the exhibit starts with definitions, language, yes. right? What, what words do we use you call it? to talk about the, this thing that happened? Well, one of the things we learned specifically with our community engagement mm -hmm. um, was that a lot of people didn't experience it the same way. You had people who lived on the same block, Stephen, mm -hmm. who did not <laughs> experience you different it. Stories. And they'll tell you it was a riot, and the other person will say it was a rebellion. Right. And so we thought that it was important for us to level set and provide you with the context of what those terms mean, mm -hmm. give you perspective around why language matters and how it was being reported, but also give you an opportunity to make your own conclusions, right? right? And right. I think that as a historical society, we lead with the history, but more importantly, we stay true to our mission, and that's telling Detroit stories and why they matter. Mm -hmm no matter where you're from. Yeah. And that's what our team here did with the exhibition was really kind of have a scaffolding approach to yeah. how you kind of go through something that's so complex mm -hmm. and emotional and meaningful without watering it down. Uh, talk about what you want someone who goes through your exhibit to come out the other side thinking about their role in what comes next. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Simple question, come <laughs> yeah. on. Huge. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll, um, you know, it, I think really broadening perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I keep going back to that word, uh -huh. but, you know, it, I think we bring a lot to this exhibit. You know, everybody has either heard a story, mm -hmm. experienced it themselves, and they, they bring something to it, which is actually part of the exhibit. We're hoping to get an idea of what you bring to it first. Um, and see if we, you know, maybe if we, if we <laughs> change that or, you know, right. alter that in some way by the time you leave. You but know, you should be, you should be a different person almost by the time you go through all of this and come out the other I, side. You know, I don't know if it'd be a different person, <laughs> but definitely somebody who is maybe thinking a little bit more broadly, yeah. you know, and hoping to walk in somebody else's shoes a right. little bit. Because a lot of the oral histories that we use, we have a great tank interactive. It's very moving. And, you know, it's something where if you don't walk away from that, having your heartstrings pulled, yeah. you know, then, it, then we did something wrong. Right, right. Uh, yeah. And ask you sort of the same question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do we need to do so that 50 years from now, we all look back and say, hey, that was a turning point. We, we, we got all this stuff sort of straightened out. Yeah, well, to lift it up a little bit more, this mm -hmm. is part of an entire uh, five-year community engagement right. project. Right. The, the, the exhibition is our strength and the crescendo of it. But more importantly, <laughs> we've developed a model. It's called Engage, Reflect, That's and right. Act. Right, and there's critical imperatives that we want to point people to that are going to be helpful in terms of moving us forward to the future. That's economic inclusion and opportunity, dealing with race, uh, investing in young people, and really getting into the neighborhoods, right? And so what we're hoping is, is that we can bring diverse voices and communities together around the historic effects of this crisis so people can find their role in the present to inspire the future. So the objective is, is that you walk away with a personal sense of why it matters to you and connecting you with uh, all of our 100 community partners and organizations who are doing the work right now. Mm -hmm. Detroit's not a blank canvas. We're not starting from square one. <laughs> right. People have been putting in work for years. We're working with organizations like Community Development Advocates of Detroit, the, the Wright Museum, New Detroit, uh, neighborhood groups, VIP mentoring, right? We're trying to set the tone for an opportunity for all of us to inclusively move forward together mm -hmm. without forgetting about how we can learn from our history and giving context and credence to what happened. This is not a celebration. We're not commemorating a bad moment. We're taking advantage of our own narrative. We're taking control of that, right? And then the last, pieces, we're challenging everyone from grassroots all the way to the corporate, you know, 
philanthropic and right? yeah, yeah, to the boardrooms. What is your role in helping Detroit move forward? And if we're not careful, and if we're not paying attention, we could lose a sense of connectivity to our own history. Yeah. So we have to tell the story. Yeah. All right. Uh, congratulations on the exhibit. It really is. Uh, just mind-blowing. Everyone should take some time in the next year to come see it. And, we hope uh, so. And thank you to all of our staff and our board of trustees and our, yeah. all of our sponsors yeah. and all of the foundations who helped because this was a group effort. A story this big takes all of us. Detroit is a classroom and the world is watching. Yes. All right. Uh, congratulations again. Thank and thanks thank for you. being here. Yep. All right. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. And thanks to the Detroit Historical Museum for being our host today. Make sure you check out the Detroit 67 Perspectives exhibit. Meanwhile, you can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929.